good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the EC Council for this uh, invitation to speak. Uh, my name is Frankie Chu, and I'm based in Singapore. So today I will share with you one of the ways, if not the recommended way, how an organization can meet the personal data protection requirements by leveraging on potentially already existed functions in the organization. So um, let's begin by going through the typical personal data protection requirements. As you can see on the slide, first of all, uh, the roles and responsibilities within the organizations, and then followed by the identification and recording of personal data usage. And then the third, risk assessment and treatment, and then followed by the training and awareness. In my past organizations uh, I work for, and the current organization, I have been using the British Standard 10012 as a guidelines. Uh, last year, the ISO 27701 was issued. Uh, I have been looking into that as well, but I have not formally uh, adopted uh, ISO 27701 into my framework. The 2017 versions of British Standard has been aligned uh, with the EU's GDPR. Hence, if you look at uh, requirement 5 to requirement 10 on my slide, they are similar to the GDPR's data protection principles. And last but not least, the requirement to respect the rights of the data subjects, which later on I will share with you if you're not familiar, what are the rights of the data subjects that you know commonly being observed. And you might also be realized that security per se is just one of the list of requirements in the personal data protection. Now I live in Singapore and in Singapore, most of data protection officers that I meet in the association were, most, were mostly lawyers. So they often ask me a, a classic question, why is it so difficult for many to comply with the data privacy law? In Singapore, uh, our data privacy law is known as the PDPA, Personal Data Protection Act, which was enacted in 2012. My answer to such a classic question is because data in the company has become like the blood in our body. The data that companies collected from their customers it's not just used to deliver the promised goods or services, but also used uh, for business intelligence, marketing, etc. Even for the delivery of goods and services, nowadays many companies are leveraging on the ecosystem, and hence there are a lot of data being distributed, shared, transferred, uh, whatever you may call it. A good example in today's pandemic of COVID-19, governments around the world are issuing contact tracing apps. However, there are privacy fears surrounding the data sharing. In Singapore, again, only a quarter of the population installed the tracing app on their mobile phones. And according to the media reports, privacy concerns were one of the reasons cited by the public as to why they have not downloaded the app. So what do aware consumers usually check before they agreeing to share their data openly? So how do we make sure that we understand this, right? First, normally it's about trust in who is storing the data. Most of consumers uh, really think a lot about trust. Second, transparency on what data is collected. So the 
the tracing app, for example, might be showing certain things on the user interface, but people was asking, is that all what is actually collected from my devices, for example? And thirdly, whether the consent withdrawal or the opting out is possible when it's needed. Now, how do you make sure that the data sharing is safe for the data subjects? How do we in charge of the data? I know some companies that have in recent years set up a separate or a dedicated data security or data security and privacy function on top of the existing information security function. Well, this is not bad at all if the organization has so much budget to invest. Today, I would like to share with you my own experience on how the information security function and the data governance function in an organization could actually work well together if the data governance function exists. Look, it might be called differently in your organization. So what is data governance? Many organizations define data governance as an overall management of availability, relevancy, usability, integrity, and security of the data in that company, in that enterprise, based on the internal data standards and policy that also control the data usage. The data governance include the people, processes, and systems needed to manage and protect the, the enterprise's data assets. Hence, you could see on my slide, the ingredients, the outline of the data governance framework should have those things in minimum or at minimum. Not all countries with the data privacy law will require a data protection officer or in short DPO mandatorily. Hence, in those cases, the role might be assumed by a data security and data privacy leader. Now on this slide, I put together the personal data protection requirements from the earlier slide, the data governance framework from the earlier slide, and the information security management system, which is typically established based on ISO 27000. The idea here, if both work together and being practiced diligently, then we should be able to cover all the data protection requirements. Now let's talk about the people. For those who are familiar with the ISO 27000, uh, you know in uh, security compliance, the accountability from the top management whether it's on the information security in general, and in this context, we're talking about the personal data, uh, has to be really established. So it is the accountability of the top management to actually make sure that the organization that they led can really comply with the data protection requirements and be able to actually demonstrate demonstrate whether they really practice those framework diligently, religiously, and, and not just good on paper. Now, as I mentioned earlier, not all countries mandatorily requiring data protection officer. So in those jurisdictions where DPO is not mandatory, the company may appoint a suitable officer to actually lead the data security and privacy. Now, what is uh, suggested in this proposed framework is to have a group, to have a group of people, a group of concerned people, a group of subject matter experts to come together to form a work group 
to assist the data protection officer in his or her you know day-to-day -day function so what do they do uh, i'm just quickly read out what i put on the slide the development and review of the data security and privacy related policies and procedures the overall responsibility for monitoring the compliance uh, ensuring that the privacy impact assessment, the risk assessment is being done when it's necessary. When the local or national laws require notification of some events to the uh, supervisory authority or the privacy commissioner, uh, that should be done. Training and ongoing awareness. And last but not least, the mechanism of the data disclosure or data sharing is being uh, reviewed and approved. Now, typically the company deal with a lot of data sets, deal with tons of databases. So the respective data sets, the respective databases should have uh, people that call themselves the data owners or the data stewards who then collaborate with the DPO and the work group to actually enhance and develop the relevant policies and processes further, uh, ensuring the adherence to the policy and guidelines, assigning the classification of their data. This is very, very important, which I will explain uh, in the next slide. And last but not least, of course, providing the resolution to any data related issues. Now, before I go to the last box, which is the internal audit, we have data users. I did not put it here on the slide because obviously the data users also have their responsibilities. What are they? Uh, so first of all, I think the data users should understand that there are policies and procedures in place. They will not have the access to the data at their liberties. There must be SOP for them to follow. For example, how to gain the access rights to the data. And also if, you know, inadvertently they obtain the access somehow, they should understand what to do. Or if the data users actually discover data or information which have not been properly labeled by the data owner, they need to understand that the expectation is for them to assume the default classification. For example, if I'm a data user, I come across a data which has not been labeled in terms of classification that I should presume at least confidential. That data is confidential until the data owners say otherwise. And of course, the whole thing will only be, uh, be really effective and efficient if the internal audit will conduct the regular internal audits to make sure that the executions of the framework, uh, it is effective. And if it is not, they should feedback to the top management, again, you know, coming down from the top, what are the things that are not effective that need to be fixed? Now, what is data classification? Classification is a categorization of data based on its type and its level of sensitivity. Based on the fact that what could happen if the organization have the data unauthorizedly disclosed or altered or destroyed. Classification help to determine the appropriate baseline controls. So again, the whole thing, the whole framework will not work if the basic things called classification is not really executed properly because that what determine the baseline security controls. Classification is also applicable to all types of data, including documented information. So documented information like Microsoft Word document, PowerPoint slides that I have. So 
let me show you what I have on the main or the cover slide. I put that in the corner, the bottom left corner, you could see for the general public. So I label this document, even though it's not a raw data, as public, meaning that this document can be shared uh, without specific permission from me, unless if, for example, EC Council uh, claim for copyright. Now, some data may have little sensitivity in isolation. In isolation means that when a particular data stand alone, it may have a very little sensitivity, but may be highly sensitive when the data is actually in the aggregation. And therefore, aggregation of data should also be considered when the data owner is classifying the data. When the data collection contains data relating to more than one classification level. So for example, that you have uh, level one and level two, or level two and level three, or level two and level four, the higher level should be assigned to that collection of data as a whole. So these are the uh, a few key principles of the data classification. Now on these slides, I'm putting an example of data classification. Now you don't have to follow this, but this is what I practice in many organizations. Vertically, you could see there's the type of data. I classify them or group them into customer data, service data, company data. And then horizontally from left to the right, you could see the level of sensitivity from level one for the general public, level two for the internal. Internal means that that data can move freely, the information can move freely within the organization of or group of companies. And then level three confidential and last uh, column will be level four for restricted or secret or strictly confidential data whatever people like to call it. And I put it, and I put some examples as well to, to help you to understand uh, what's the difference. And, and, and even if the table like this exists in my organization, this kind of table will only serve as a guideline. The final call eventually whether a particular field or column in a database table to be labeled as level two or level three resides with the data owner. So the data owner has the ultimate responsibility to actually label the data. Now let's talk about data integrity. What is data integrity? Data integrity is the overall completeness and accuracy of the data. You know, some common threads that we learn from the information security management system. Things like, you know, misconfiguration, malware, cyber attack, those uh, common threads to the integrity of the data. So, I also list down a list of measures that can be implemented to actually protect the data integrity. And still within the topic of data integrity, there might, there might be uh, situations where your local or national law will require you to respect the rights of data subject. The data subjects are natural person. They, they, they can be your customers. They can be your, uh, I don't know, uh, other than customers, probably uh, individuals that dealing with the company. And they have the rights given by the legislation. For example, the rights to access the information, 
the rights to request for corrections if the data is not correct, the right for the right to erasure, the right to be forgotten if someone come forward and say, hey, I don't want to have anything to do with the organization any longer, right? Or a GDPR like the right to data portability. So we need to have the procedures to actually say, how are we going to respond to the requests from the data subjects should they arise? Now, I often receive a, re I, I often receive a question uh, from people, whether or not an organization should just erase everything that related to a person or activities or record of transaction related to the data subject if the data subject actually requested for it. My straight answer is yes, but there might be also uh, a need for you to understand that as an organization, you also have the rights, you also have the obligations given by the local or the national laws. For example, that typically in the English system, the contract law will require you to keep uh, contractual activities, transactions for a certain number of years to actually deal with the situation of uh, dispute or civil actions that might be raised. So on one hand that the laws give the rights to the data subjects for them to be forgotten. On the other hand that you have the rights, you have the obligations to actually also keep those records for X number of years. So the balance is that, or the meeting point is that, what probably could be exposed to the public through the uh, membership portal, through the transactional portal, typically those front end data will have to be erased. However, if we go beyond that, things that sit within your organization, in your archive, in your data warehouse, for example, those data, you still have the rights or obligation to actually preserve them. But they will eventually will be gone as well when we come to talk about the data retention and disposal. Now, this is the typical data life cycle, okay, that have to be part of the data governance framework, starting from the data collection. Now, the data collection has to be lawful. What, what does it mean by lawful? If the data privacy law is saying that you need to collect data with consent, then you must have that consent. Otherwise, it will be unlawful. Right, And the data collection has to be fair and transparent. You might not get the data directly from the data subject. You might get it from data transfer process. You might get it from you know, uh, data harvesting and so on. So you have the obligation to actually notify the data subject and hence that you, know, you practice the transparency in the data collection. And then you move to the data storage. You need to make sure that the data storage is well protected and their quality control, because without the quality control, then there will be a lot of inaccuracy, redundancy, and so on. And then remember, classification. You need to label them. And sometimes you might also need to segregate them based on the needs. And then make sure that data is backed up. And then move to the data usage. 
Access control is very important because there's no security without the access control. And data usage has to be done for a legitimate purpose. And this is also the, uh, the uh, GDPR data privacy principle that data is processed for specific legitimate purpose. And then data sharing. Data sharing, whether internally or externally, will have to be pre-approved, will have to be controlled. There must be a procedure to review and approve if data were to be shared with the external or transferred to uh, subcontractors for service delivery and so on. And last but not least, as part of the data life cycle, retention and disposal. It is the GDPR uh, data privacy principle that data should not be stored longer than necessary. And when, they are, when the data is going to be disposed, it has to be disposed in the secure manner. And then the data security come to the picture. Now, this is uh, something that we should already be well first with uh, if we if we have been practicing in the information security world but i just want to stress that uh, managing security breaches uh, could have additional requirements from the data privacy law and you need to be aware of those for example in some countries uh, breaches will have to be uh, i mean the, the stakeholders, the privacy commissioners, the data subject will need to be notified, for example, for any potential or breaches not more than 72 hours from the time the, the breaches uh, was known. So if there are specific requirements like this, uh, you will need to include that into your procedure. Uh, of incidents response or managing the security breaches. And also in the world of uh, supply chain, right, when the information processing or business activity is being subcontracted, the security will need uh, or will deserve a lot more attention there. So uh, come to the end of my presentation. Uh, I may not be able to give you every single detail of what will need to go into that, uh, the data governance framework. So you might have a data team, you might have a data science team, you might have a data engineering team in the company. Maybe they, they don't have the data governance framework. I hope this gives you some idea because uh, it is very strategic. Once you have it in place, then combine with the information security management system that you have, uh, you, could, you could address those uh, data protection requirements uh, entirely without have to you know, invest heavily, setting up a new function, setting up a new department. If you have any questions, uh, I can either take your questions after this, or I have uh, my contact uh, on this last screen. Uh, do write me an email, uh, and I will make sure that I'll spend time to respond to your questions or queries or any comments that you might have. Thank you, everyone.